just, just for the record, I, I, I've done a few of these, and what tends to happen is we run out of time. <laughs> we don't get to cover everything. So I usually prepare something that you can take away with you, and it'll either reinforce what we talked about or it'll fill in the blanks. Um, so basically, today I have um, an array of lights I'm going to go through and explain. I think this is more about the lights than the camera. We will discuss cameras, we will discuss lenses, but this is also mostly about light, how you use light, how you interpret you know, locations that you walk into, and so on and so forth. Now, it's important to get across to you that anything that I'm saying today is essentially the sum total of my personal experiences. I don't want anybody to ever think that there's only one way to do any of this. You, you, it is up to you as an individual to absorb as much as you can workshops like this from your own personal experience and build your own sense of what you like and what you don't like, or be able to make one choice versus another. Part of the reason I have a variety of lights here is to demonstrate to you the characteristics of these lights and why you might choose one versus the other, why one may be a better choice than the other. But if you were left with only one kind of light, you would still try to make something out of it. And that's all down to your perception um, of what makes a good image and your training and your experience. Um, but I'll start first with um, how the process begins for me. Typically, um, my, my experience has been I do a certain amount of repeat business with people I've worked with before, producers or directors. And in some cases, I'm starting that project from the very beginning. <laughs> in some cases, the project has already begun. And in some other cases, I'm working with people I've never worked with before. Um, who I've been recommended to by producers or directors that I worked with. Um, so it's, a, it's important because, I, because what we do is collaborative and because you serve a director's vision or director and producer's vision, it's important to be able to figure out ways to work with these different scenarios. So for example, um, JT and I have a mutual collaborator, a director named Sam Pollard. If I get a call from Sam Pollard, it might be a call about a job that Sam has already begun, that I did not start with him, in which he needs some footage shot. Perhaps the cinematographer who's been working on it is not, not available, and so on and so forth. That's a very different scenario than when I get a call from Sam and says, I got this project we're going to be working on from its inception, which means I have way more input from the inception because we get to bounce ideas off of each other based on the parameters of the story. So in a situation where I get to work with Sam, I hope to be doing something with Sam soon, actually, and we're starting from scratch. And it's supposed to be a piece about art we get to formulate our approach from scratch. But we also have to draw on intangible things. You know, it's like you're making something from, you're making something out of nothing, right? You're deciding what aspects of the story, um, or at least Sam's gonna decide what aspects of the story are important. And in so doing, we have to collaborate to come to an understanding how we wanna convey that visually. It affects the choices of locations we shoot in, it affects the way we shoot, uh, lenses, lights, and so on and so forth. Whether we move the camera, whether we don't move the camera. So in that scenario, I get to be part of that process from the very beginning. There are other scenarios where I don't get to do it from the beginning. The, direct, the director has gone through that process with somebody else. So I wind up being involved as an interpreter of somebody else's process, which means, you know, a different, completely different mindset, you know. Um, so in a scenario such as that, I will always ask f 
for references, whatever references I can get relating to that project, which usually will mean stuff that has been shot beforehand. Decision as to what camera to shoot with, decision what kind of lighting to use, those have already been made. One of the questions I would ask a director as a collaborator is, is it important for me what I'm shooting to match anything that's been shot already? Or do I have the freedom to <coughs> interpret this particular sh shoot the way I want to interpret it? More times than not, people want you to match existing footage, which means the parameters are already set. <coughs> and in, in situations such as that, I will ask for samples of previously shot interviews to be sent to me so I can take a look, make an evaluation, what kind of lighting they did, and so on and so forth, so I can put my lighting order in. In some of those situations, to further aid me in making those decisions, a producer will make available to me equipment lists that they already shot with, so that takes a lot of the guesswork <coughs> out. I've also been in situations as well where um, I got put on the phone with the other cinematographer and they walked me through what they did. It makes it even easier. Um, but it, it almost doesn't matter what situation you're in. You, you, you have to build a sort of visual vocabulary of your own that allows you to, um, to be that collaborator that you're supposed to be for your producers and, and your directors. Um, and it's a process. You know, each job is a learning opportunity. Each job, if you're, I, I like to think, if you're doing, if you're doing it right, you should be learning something new every time you point the camera at something or somebody, right? You know, at a certain point, there's certain things you should be able to do with your eyes shut. Um, but then, where's the fun in that? You should actually be content with what you know in order to be able to put that aside and try something new. And if you, if you are at a point where you can start a project from scratch with a collaborator, somebody who there's a certain amount of trust involved between the two of you, take full advantage of it. It's a, it's a learning opportunity. Um, so when you start out a project with a director, you should have a sense of, there, there, there are a series of questions that you want to engage, a little bit of back and forth that you want to engage that gets you to a point where you both recognize what it is you're trying to accomplish and build on. Um, I know I'm here talking about um, sort of very abstract way, I guess, of getting the point across. I'm here talking about shooting interviews, but one of, one of my, my most profound collaborative experiences came working with a filmmaker for a documentary in which we were not going to be shooting any interviews. I was asked to shoot some B-roll for a documentary, uh, New York-based B-roll, because there was another team that shot in the South. Um, New York-based B-roll for a documentary about James Baldwin. And the director was adamant that the only voice that was going to be heard in the documentary was going to be James Baldwin's. So we were not going to shoot any interviews of anybody talking about James Baldwin. It was going to be James Baldwin talking about the things he was experiencing and feeling. But what he wanted from us was to shoot some footage that was interpretive, visually interpretive, of what James Baldwin was talking about. And you wind up in this place where somebody's saying to you, I'm giving you license. Like, you know, forget all you've ever done, forget all you know, right? How you normally would approach a documentary subject. I'm saying we're going into some uncharted territory. A lot of documentaries you see, eventually you get somebody sat in a chair, camera pointed at them, we shoot an interview. He's like, we're not doing that on this film. So we have to trust each other, you know? So we, we, we collaborated. We talked a lot about feeling, mood, trying to tap into something here, you know? 
Because at the end of the day, these are, these are tools. These are tools. They mean absolutely nothing until somebody turns them on and points them in one direction versus another. And that's you guys, right? And in order for you to do that, you have to develop, one, you have to develop sensibilities. You know, watch films, study photographs, study paintings, because there's a direct lineage between that and this. And it's with that, it's with that kind of vocabulary that you get to collaborate. And then when somebody comes along and says to you, we're, we're looking for intangibles. How do we interpret? That's, it's a big challenge. Because usually somebody pulls out a chalkboard and, <laughs> and they can sketch something for you. And you're like, oh, that's it? OK, let's do that. Somebody's like, I remember the director said to me, we were talking about moving the camera. And he said to me, he had sent me a rough cut. And all he said to me, in because he was in Paris and I'm in New York. And, you know, how do you collaborate with somebody who's not standing right beside you? And he said this thing to me. He's like, listen to James Baldwin's voice. Listen to the pace of his voice. And let that be the guide to whether you move the camera, how you move the camera, how fast you move it, how slow you move it, and so on and so forth. And, you know, when somebody says that to you, it's like, okay, hmm. <laughs> you know, what do you do? You try to tap, you try to get to that place. You try to get to that place. And, you know, so, um, I mean, that was, that was, I think as an, as an artist, as a creator, somewhere in the back of your head, that sentiment should always be there. How can you, how can you, how can you visualize, create, demonstrate, evoke emotions, with these tools. Now that doesn't rest solely on you because you're a collaborator, but that, that process between you and your collaborator, between you and a director, is something that you have to be equipped to nourish. And that, 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 that vocabulary comes from, from studying, from studying and from experience. Some of what I demonstrate here today is experience, you know? So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I, wanted to do, I wanted to do, as opposed to just talking about what we do, I thought it was important that we should do what we do, and so that you guys can be a part of that process. Um, so I want, I'm go at some point, we're going to go through the differences between these lights, what these lights do, why you would choose one light versus another. But before any of this comes into play, when you have an assignment, you get a chance to, you get a chance to use your tools based on the locations you're going to shoot in and the subjects that you're going to shoot. These are instincts that you develop with time. When I get a call from a director saying, we've got a shoot to do next week, it's imp always important for me to get a chance to look at the location, or for them to get a chance to look at the location, or for there to be some visual representation of the location for me. Because that allows me, it's, it's not so much a question of knowing, <coughs> it's not so much a question of knowing what pitfalls to avoid, or surprises, what it really is is allowing me to evaluate how to make the best use of the space that I'm in. Um, a lot of times we go into people's homes to do interviews. Um, you walk into a person's home. It's furnished with their personality and so on and so forth. You make choices about what is important, how you're going to utilize that space. You know, you know what, if you know what that person contributes to the story based on your discussions with the director, you should be able to walk in there and decide how you're going to use that space to give the director what they want. Um, lots of times in, in documentaries, because of budget constraints and so on and so forth, 
you don't necessarily get a chance to scout a location. I would suggest to you that as a cinematographer, a photographer, a practitioner, whatever, that you fight for the opportunity. And I'll give you an example. I, 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 I suggest you fight for the opportunity to scout your locations in advance. And at the very least, if you cannot scout the location, um, there are times when I, I'm fortunate enough to be paid to go and scout a location. And there are times when I don't get a chance, when I don't get paid, but I go ahead and do the scout anyway, because it's, it's for my benefit at the end of the day. Um, if you don't get the chance to scout a location, try to get photographs of the location so that you can make assessments about the space and how you use the space. I can't stress this enough. I will give you an example. I did a shoot a couple of weeks ago where by email description, back and forth, I was told we were going to be shooting talent in front of an American flag. And I was told the dimensions of the flag were 25 foot by 9 foot, right? The director said, I don't want to shoot, I don't plan to shoot off, off the flag. You know, the person's going to be in front of the flag, and I want to be able to see that flag end to end. Which made me think, hmm, it's going to be a little tricky because a flag that measures 25 by 9 is much more, much more fits and sort of anamorphic aspect ratio. Do you know what an anamorphic aspect ratio is? Right, then it does a regular, okay, an anamorphic aspect ratio is a widescreen aspect ratio. A lot of your fantastic action films and so on and so forth get shot this way. The screen is a lot wider than it normally will. I'll go into detail with that in a little bit. But anyway, the proportions of the flag fit more an anamorphic aspect ratio. And if the director didn't want to shoot off the flag, shooting in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio was going to be difficult. So I asked him, if he wanted to shoot, shoot it anamorphic, or at least widescreen, even if it wasn't anamorphic. Uh, he said, ah, he didn't think so. You know, so I was like, well, it's going to be tricky if you want the flag to be behind the person and not shoot off the flag, because, you know. Long story short, we wound, up going to, we wound up scouting the location, and it turned out that the flag was actually <coughs> 25 foot by 15. Right. Whole different ball game. So it meant we could shoot it 16 by 9 it, because it was closer to that aspect ratio. So the whole shooting widescreen thing disappeared. But it also had implications for the amount of light that I needed to order to light the flag because the flag was literally six foot, six foot higher than they told me it was. The point being, if I had relied strictly on the email, communication, I would have been walking in there to shoot a 25 foot by 9 flag. And that would have caused me all kinds of problems, you know. So, and these are problems that can be avoided. So, you go, and I'm sure JT, you can speak to this too, about the importance of what a location might sound like, one versus another, right? Yeah, but I'll virtually never ask a sound person to go. Yeah, no, that, no, you don't, yes, but. There are things that JT will go, yeah, that's why you, you sort of want, they wouldn't ask you to, but you would want an idea, right? Because it affects what you bring. It affects what you, how you approach the job. So I always ask for an opportunity to look at, at a location before I go in and shoot. I also, um, if the subject we're shooting is somebody I'm not familiar with, I go online and I look them up see what they look like. Always pays to know what your subject looks like. You know, male, female, wears glasses, doesn't wear glasses, has hair, has no hair, high cheekbones, you know, the whole nine yards. I mean, at the end of the day, to do that person justice, to present them as they are, um, you should have some idea if you need to take special care, you know, for that particular person. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, when we start out, when, when I start out a project, uh, it's important to get the artistic parameters, and then it's also important for me to get a sense of 
what the location um, requires. Communication, I can't stress it enough, is very, 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 very important. The other thing too is that when I, when I, um, when I look at a location, it also allows me to make a determination about how much time things are going to take, which is also important to the producer as much as it's the director, because then they can schedule their days properly. Sometimes a director wants to shoot two, possibly three interviews a day. Smart directors usually won't shoot more than two a day, right? That means there's no smart director. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I know there are a couple of directors I know that will not shoot more than two interviews a day. They just won't. I know one that would like to shoot four. Yeah, right, which is <laughs> insane. Um, and uh, literally on the crazy side, I've shot seven interviews in one day. Yeah. But, you know, it was one location, three levels, but it was a pain. It, yeah, it's just, it's not, it's, it, you don't get anything out of doing that. It's kind of productive. But yeah, I get a chance to, if I look at a location or I can size up a location, know what the location is, how easy it is to get in and out of it, I can say to a producer, ah, we can't do three interviews in one day. You know, um, one of them is just going to take too much time. Um, if you ever find yourself shooting, you, you know, this is my experience. This is my experience. If you ever find yourself shooting in a corporate building, add a whole bunch of time because you got to navigate their security, you know, their security apparatus. And that usually takes time away. And if you don't, if you, if you don't account for that time separate from the time you need, to do what you do, you basically you're going to get stuck. You're going to get stuck. All right, so um, yeah, so those are the things that, that I have to evaluate um, before I even put a camera on a tripod, point a camera at anything, and turn a light on. Um, so uh, cam <coughs> not cameras, cameras I've, I've worked with a variety of cameras. I think it is your job to acquaint yourself with as many cameras as you possibly can, whether you work with them or not. Technology is changing all the time. New cameras are coming out all the time. Um, we tend to have, we tend to have our, our favorites. You know, you become comfortable and you become cozy with the attributes that, you know, a particular camera demonstrates or, or a series of cameras demonstrates. Some, some of us have talked about this a little bit earlier, so <laughs> some wholeheartedly a Canon user, love Canon cameras, always have. Um, but there are times when I have to shoot with cameras that I don't necessarily love. At some point, they're all tools; they all do the same thing. They may have quirks, you know, that are unique to one, different with another, and so on and so forth. So it's it's your job to know what the what each of these cameras can do. Um, you don't have to know the intricacies, you don't have to know every last thing about them, but you should be able to form impressions about them. Because when I start a project, if I have the freedom to choose a camera to shoot with, I choose a camera I know. I choose a camera I like. I choose a camera I know the outcome. I'm not fond of this camera, but I shot with this camera a couple months ago. We got good images out of it. But if the director, I mean the director owned the camera, <laughs> So, I was, and I wasn't going to fight with the director. I offered to bring my own camera. But he's like, ah, I got my FS5, and we're going to use the FS5. Um, I still have to be able to make good images out of that camera. So, it wouldn't be my first choice of camera if someone said, pick whatever camera you want. But a good chunk of what you do, you won't necessarily get to choose what you want. If it isn't that the director owns the camera, the budget's going to decide, you know, what kind of camera you use. Same thing with lights, you know. There's, I mean, I got a bunch of hot lights here, which almost no one uses these days because they're just <coughs> too hot. But I'll, and I'm demonstrating them for a reason. But there are times when, when these are cheap and affordable, and they still do what they've always done. So you just, you know, that's what you wind up with. Um, so yes, uh, we're in a digital era. 
No, hardly anybody shoots film anymore. Has anybody shot film in here before? Anybody? Shot film? Yeah, a long but time ago. 35, 16 millimeter, 20 right. years ago. Right, right, okay. We're in the digital era. Um, by show of hands, who shoots in here? Who, or who has shot before? Right. If there's anything I'm sort of, I know someone in here said they didn't understand what anamorphic was. And we, I can explain that to you at some point, either in the course of this or aside from this. Um, if there's anything I touch upon that don't understand, just flag me real quick. So you know what the sensor on the camera is, right? Right? That's the receptor. That's where the image is formed. It's pretty much the same place that the film back in the day would go through. You know the difference between the, difference, the different sensor sizes? No. OK, so <clears throat> typically, in, typically in the digital market these days, you have a sensor, a, essentially the smallest of the sensors that's out there for digital cinema cameras. I'm not talking about video cameras, because that's a whole different ball game. Um, digital cin cin cinema cameras have, sen have different size sensors depending on the manufacturer. You get a, a sensor that measures 4x3, got a sensor which measures 16x9, Super 35, whatever they call it, um, which is sort of almost the standard at this point. Every almost every manufacturer, and perhaps every manufacturer with the exception of one. No, that's not even true. They, Panasonic, they have, they have Super 16 sensors. So yeah, you have 4 by 3 sensor, <coughs> Super 16 sensor, and what we now know as a full frame sensor, which your DSLRs have always had, like your, your Canons and your Sonys. But even the digital cinema manufacturers are now manufacturing digital cinema cameras with full frame sensors. Uh, Sony just released one uh, called the Venice. Uh, Airflex released one a couple years ago called the large format camera. They have these uh, uh, th what measures three by two sensors. Three by two is essentially the same size as your still camera from back in the film days. So the lenses that are made for those cameras work perfectly well with those cameras. Why is sensor size important? We actually experienced this earlier today when we were looking at these cameras, because these cameras do have different sensor sizes. And what you think, the lenses you think might work on one camera, might not necessarily work the same way on another camera, and it's all down to the sensor size. So what we, call, what we, what we would call a full-frame camera today is not exactly, but the closest thing to what the 35 millimeter motion picture camera uh, capture area used to be. Um, 35, they still shoot those, it's just most, most everything is digital these days. But the lenses that were made for those cameras migrated into the digital world. So we now use those same lenses on digital sensors. They're no longer running film through the gate. But because those sensors are not necessarily the same size as the 35 millimeter <coughs> frame that they used to cover, the lenses all of a sudden act differently. And you have to be knowledgeable and aware of that. So for example, on this camera, I have a full frame still lens, which is a 24 to 70. It's only a 24 to 70 on a full frame camera. I take this lens and I put it on some other camera, like this. This is not a full frame camera. It's no longer a 24 to 70. Right. The sensor is smaller than a full frame sensor, so it's using a smaller part of the lens. Important to understand these because you might go into a location you shoot and you need a wide lens, a wide field of view, 
and all of a sudden because of a magnification factor, you don't have that anymore. Because that 24 is not a 24 anymore on that particular camera. It's a 24 on a full frame camera. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a 24. Um, I've been in that situation before. Not, not because I was shooting, you know, was, and this is, I'll admit to this, this is a miscalculation on my part. Um, we had to shoot high speed on one of these cameras. And to shoot high speed, you essentially are shooting a cropped version of an already cropped sensor, right? So the sensor was, I was using full frame lenses on a not full frame sensor. So I was already losing something on the lens. And then we had to shoot high speed as well, which made me lose even more. So we, the wide shot we needed to get, we couldn't get it. We actually literally had to send for a wider lens. You know, because it just, it's just one of those things. You just, I didn't realize how much we actually lost when we went high speed. Um, never make that mistake again, right? Because you learn from these. So, but that's why I say it's important, you know, to know the camera you're working with, uh, the lenses that you're working with, and how those, especially, you get used to, I work with this lens all the time. I work with this lens all the time. I also have to know how this lens works when I put it on one camera versus another, right? Because something's going to change. Because they're not all. I use this ca on the Canon C300. I use this lens all the time. But this is a smaller sensor on this camera, so it covers a different area. I mean, I use an adapter that helps preserve some of the, but it's not the exact same. So when you're picking and choosing your lenses for your projects, you also need to be familiar with the peculiarities of the camera you're putting them on, especially if it's not a camera that you're familiar with. Sometimes that means, I'm just, like I said earlier before, sometimes you, you, you need to scout a location whether you're getting paid or not because it's good for you. Sometimes you need to take your own time, go to a camera house and ask politely, I need to look at such and such camera. I've never seen it before, and I'm going to be shooting with it in a couple of weeks. Don't wait till you get to a job to start learning a camera, because it'll be embarrassing for you, and you might not get hired again. <laughs> right? You know, th think of it as an investment in yourself. You know, learn as much as you can about, and the technology changes all the time, which means your, you know, your work's cut out for you, but that's your job. When you hand out your card and say, I'm a cinematographer, you better mean it. And that means doing the research. That means getting out there. I, I'm not a big, <coughs> I, I try to go to my fair share of tech you know, uh, conventions, but I'm not a tech head that way. But I find my ways to keep track of changes in, in camera technology and, and lenses and so on and so forth. Because it's at some point, uh, you know, yeah, you don't want to get caught out there <laughs> not knowing, you know, not, not being that familiar with, um, yeah. So um, having said that I'm not a tech head, which is true, um, I think it's important to It's important to find a way to um, commune with your equipment where it's not about the equipment, if that makes any sense, right? At the end of the day, you're speaking through it. <coughs> Camera lens mean absolutely nothing on their own, you know? Um, I think in the, I, I took some time in the notes that I, that I gave you. I made some general comments and I made some specific comments. The specific comments relate to my sensibilities, how I approach what I do. Um, and I'm much more interested in um, finding ways to, for that to come through in, in whatever I do. 
Does it always work? No. Um, but I don't want to shoot, even, even, when, even when I get a sample of something that's been shot that I have to match, I'm not going to match it slavishly because the person who's sitting in front of my camera is different than the person in the image that was sent to me. And I would be doing them a disservice if I just carbon copied what somebody else did, you know. Yes, frame, size, and all of that, but I'm going to move the camera a little closer because <laughs> I just, from the notes you'll see, I'm, I'm, I prefer to be in proximity to the person I'm photographing. So I have a tendency to like wider lenses. When we came and I asked you to put what lens on there? What lens did I ask you to put on there? No, no, before that. Put the 25. What other lenses do we have on there? Right. I'll always put the wider lens on first because it feels like the world I, I live in, you know. When you shoot an interview, you sit a person down. They're going to talk about people, places, and things, right? That's storytelling. This is what we do, right? People, places, and things. If I sat somebody here, I shot them on a long telephoto lens where everything in the background goes out of focus, I only have the person. I don't have the thing. I don't have the sense of environment, space. So, you know, you hear a lot in the era, like, this is my personal camera. It has a pretty small sensor, right? Uh, what do they call them? Micro Four Thirds sensor. Uh, why would you get a Micro Four Thirds sensor when there's a full frame sensor? Um, why do you need a full frame sensor? Well, because the depth of field is really shallow, and it's like, well, <laughs> that's not my cup of tea. I don't want an invisible background. I don't want an indistinguishable background. We are, as human beings, connected to space and time. If I, I could sit you on your couch and the background might be a little bit out of focus, but you can tell it's a background. And you can tell there's a bookshelf back there. And you can tell there's a lamp post on it and so on and so on. I don't want those things to go invisible, you know? That, but that's my personal choice. You have to decide how you connect to human beings. Has anybody seen Roma? Oh, yeah. Put your hands up so I can see. All right. <coughs> um, does anything I'm saying here make sense in that regard, since I brought up Roma? Yeah. What makes sense? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think I'm alluding to? You definitely get Excuse you? We can see the Meaning? There's no, cl no close-ups in that film. There are no close-ups in that film. I, I recommend you watch it. It's a black and white film. Beautifully shot. Um, but there, excuse me? Nominated for an Oscar. Won the British Academy Award last weekend. It's probably going to win the Academy Award for cinematography and for best film. Um, sorry? Sorry, you got no Golden Globe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the feel that I got out of it a lot of the time is for it's very observational. It's almost like documentary. Yeah. Like yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, think, I don't <laughs> think that he was necessarily afraid of the close up. I just don't think he was going to do it with a close up lens. You know, like, there's a scene in there between the maid and the boyfriend in the hotel room. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, I mean, I'm not spoiling it by saying it, but, but there's a close-up shot, but it's on a wide lens. Yeah, it was very wide. So you don't lose any of the sense of space. <coughs> the director, I think, made a choice, which resonated very well for me. Um, the idea that these people are not just people, but they also reside in an environment. 
and what is happening around them at all times is, impo is as important as the words coming out of their mouths. Um, for anyone who's not seen it, you will not see a film with a prolonged opening and closing sequence, right? Opening credits and closing credits. And the camera's sitting there, and you're, just, you're thinking, why is it? But stuff is happening. And it's like, these are choices that, you know, that the director makes that resonates with me, because I, you know, if you think about it, um, I like to use these two metaphors to, to get an understanding. For, I think it's important for us to understand on a humanistic level why we do what we do. Um, and I'll always dive back into history. You know, I guess it, this cross section between history and science. Um, these things, these things, they're mechanical, right? But you know, in reality, what they are? Anybody? What? Say that again? The human eye, right? These things are manufactured, they evolved to replicate the human experience. The lens is your eye, the sense is your brain, the tilt pan is your, all that in your feet are your dolly or your gimbal or your, uh, what do they call them? Drone <laughs> or, or what have you. But basically, these things are engineered to mimic the human experience. So be thoughtful when you're using them about what it, don't just use them as tools. Try to pour yourself into it. It's the same thing with light. I'll, dem you know, demonstrate and talk about this, but everything the light, everything these lights do or we're capable of doing with them is what the sun does. We replicate the experience. You know, in the old, in the early days, before there really was a Hollywood, you know, stages were made <laughs> outdoors, right? They were made on a revolving platform so that you could move your sets in relationship to what? The sun, right? Because that's what the lighting was the day. So everything we've learned about lighting and how to transform light and change light bears its relationship to something real, not artificial. And that's the same with the camera. So when we're using our cameras, whether we're shooting an interview in a documentary or we're shooting a scene in a movie, a music video, commercial, whatever, that thought should never be far from our heads, you know, that we're trying to breathe some of our humanity into what we shoot. And for that reason, you know, I, I tend to keep a certain amount of proximity. Uh, anyone in here, or I'm sure someone in here, is familiar with Roger Deakins, the cinematographer? He won last year, finally. 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 After being nominated 14 times. How dare they? <laughs> One of the absolutely most brilliant, I, most brilliant cinematographer there is out there. It, study the body of work. Um, he shot The Shawshank Redemption. Uh, help me with the Jesse James? The yes, The Assassination of Jesse James. Incredible visual film. Absolutely stunning. Um, but not just stunning in a wow, that looks flashy and beautiful way. Stunning in an emotional way, you know? Um, there's a scene in Jesse James where his body's being um, propped up so the photographers can take photographs of this dead body because these things sold like postcards. Like, you know, when you see that scene, you you understand why they shot the film the way they did, right? Uh. You understand that they couldn't just, this was a film that was happening in an era where photography was evolving. 
theater was, you know, theater was part of it too, right? So these elements went into the artistic craft of that film. But anyway, if you watch, if you watch Roger Deakins' films, or you watch um, a decent amount of European cinema, the space between the camera and the actors is this close. Because once you start getting back here and putting a longer lens on, you lose that connection. You lose that connection. So um, when, I, when, I, when I contemplate what I have to shoot, I'm usually um, already visualizing that I'm within four and a half to five feet of the subject, no further back, unless the director asks me to do it. And I usually will ask why. <laughs> I mean, no, seriously. I mean, you know, if we, if we, you know, if, if, if a sense of space, you know, if, if, if someone's just talking, I mean, we may as well shoot them against a white wall, right? I mean, at some point, if what they're talking about connects to some humanity in some way, then we should feel the environment that they're in. And um, I've been asked to shoot tight shots before, and uh, my least favorite thing to do. Um, I remember I, I, I was doing this music video this was several years ago. I worked with a director, and um, the talent was also a boxer. And you know he was doing his lyrics and all, and we shot um, shot a close up of him with a hundred millimeter lens. So you know it was like this, and he's very expressive, and he's sweating and whole nine yards, but. There's nothing in the background. We're shooting in a gym. And he's been pounding the bags and, you know, doing that whole thing. So I just said to the director, let's put the 50 millimeter and move the camera in a little bit. And he's like, okay, let's do it. So I put the 50 millimeter and moved the camera in. We got almost close to the same proportion head size wise. But all of a sudden, there was all this extra background. And there were bags that he'd been punching, swinging in the background that you would never see on a 100 millimeter lens. And all of a sudden, he's like, wow, I love the energy of that. It's like, yeah, because it isn't always, you know. Um. Anyway, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk about light for a second. I'm going to trust that you guys can do the necessary research to acquaint yourself with the cameras. Were you going to say something, JT? Say that again? Oh, and streaming. Kill the screen. You can cut the web clip. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take, if that's, is it, should I address anything relating to cameras right now? Because I'm going to jump onto lights, and we're going to, then we're going to demonstrate lights and talk about lights and how you would use them. You saw our star was two. Is that the black magic? This is the black magic with a, with a four-third sensor. And this is the FS5 with the Super 35 sensor. So, you know, the sensor on this is a bigger sensor than that, but do I care? Which makes the image that I feel like I like, that's what really matters to me, you know. Um, not, I'm not, you know, poo-pooing this camera, but, you know, I, I don't want to make it about, any more than I don't want to make it about, um, 4K versus 8K versus this, none of that stuff matters at the end of the day, you know. The Airflex cameras with their 2K sensors still have the best image on the market, in my opinion, hands down, hands down. So you can get to 55K <coughs> if you want. It doesn't, if that image doesn't feel organic and feel like, you know, and I've seen it in real time where I've gotten to experience what one sensor looks like versus another in exact same lighting conditions. And one camera feels alive and the other one feels like, eh, you know. Again, maybe that's just me not vibing with that other <laughs> camera, <laughs> falling in love, <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, that's, it's, that, this is your place. You, you, get to, you get to research. You get to bond. You get to, and I suggest, 
as you do this research, acquaint yourself with photography. Don't just think of what you do as sitting behind that. They're all part of the exercise. They all evolve. We're the, we, are the, we are the young cousin of all of those, painting, photography, and us. We're just, and then some, somebody will come along and replace us and, you know, whatever. But, no, immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in, in um, styles of photography, you know, <coughs> techniques, equipment. Go to the Museum of the Moving Image and go and look at some of those old cameras and, and understand where this came from. And then also keep in mind that it almost seems like we, we, keep, we keep improving these technologies because it's supposed to make life easier. And then what does it do? It creates expectations. And with those expectations, we create more technology to make it easier and create more expectations. And it just becomes this recurring decimal. And you get away from the essence of the thing. You know, I, I, just a quick aside, still camera, flip up screen, you know, electronic screen, you know. Uh, I know people were like, never, ever, why would you, you know, you're supposed to do this. And I show them a photograph of um, Edward Weston in the 20s looking into a box camera like this. What's the difference? Right? What's the difference? Don't make it about, don't make it about the technology or why, you know, I should do this, or I shouldn't do that. Open yourself up. Mm -hmm. Experience things. All right, so let's talk about light. Let's talk about light. I have an array of lights here, which I will use to demonstrate um, uh, differences, possibilities, choices that you might make. And then hopefully after that we'll get two volunteers, a male and a female, to sit for us and then we'll try some lighting out and see what, see what it looks like. But basically you have, um, let me just start and get this out of the way. Um, lights, lights emit a color temperature within the visible spectrum. Um, let me just start and get this out of the way. Um, lights, lights emit a color temperature within the visible spectrum. The spectrum we can see. Ultraviolets and infrared fall outside that spectrum. We can't see in that spectrum. But within, inside of those two extremes, we have a spectrum that goes from the reds all the way to the blue, from the infrared to the... So we tend to have lights classified as tungsten light. They reside on the red spectrum and the spectrum. And we have daylight lights, which reside close on to the, on the blue spectrum. And in between we have like fluorescent blue. But basically, most lights are either constant or dead, or a mix of the two. <coughs> Back in the day, when you were shooting film, you had to load film that was um, chemically engineered in its sensitivity for either or, <coughs> daylight or tungsten, or you had to use a filter to correct it. In our modern technology, you have all you need in the same camera. <laughs> so you literally can walk into a set and shoot with tungsten lights or daylight just by adjusting the uh, color temperature setting in your camera. Um, it's, um, it's, it's something that should become second nature for you. Like, you shut, set in your shutter speed or shutter angle, you set in your color temperature, and you're picking your format, whether it's uh, 1080, 2K, 4K, what have you. Those should be second nature. Um, and you should 
you, you don't ever give you. I see too many uh, YouTube stories or people posting videos like, I wanted to post this video to demonstrate blah, 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 but I, I set the wrong color temperature. Then why post it? Why, if you did it wrong, go back and do it right. <laughs> and then post it, right? Um, don't, rely on, don't rely on what you can fix in post when you can deal with it up front, you know? Um, there is a, you can, with a lot of these cameras, you can shoot a raw file, meaning you take the information directly off the sensor. It's not processed, so there's no sharpening applied. Even the settings that you make, color temperature and so on and so forth, don't get applied because the data comes right off the sensor. So people are like, well, I'll just shoot it and then uh, I'll shoot raw and then I'll fix it in post. Well, why don't you just get in the habit of shooting it right and not have to deal with all of that stuff, you know? Sometimes on the blue end of the spectrum, if you don't get the balance right, it becomes very hard to correct that blue. I've been in that situation before where you're like, you're shooting inside in one light setting and then the action goes outside and there's no chance to make an adjustment. And the stuff you shoot outside with tungsten setting becomes really hard to get skin tones to match and all of that stuff. So be exacting about that stuff. That's stuff that takes time and never be in a position where you're being rushed where you can't do it. It has to be done. That's time that you fight for. So. Regardless of which of these lights you use, set the right color temperature in, in your camera. This is a tungsten light. This is a tungsten light. This is a tungsten light. They burn at 3200K towards the red end of the spectrum. This is a, I haven't used this particular light. Is this variable? Do you know if this is variable or? All right, this is a light panel, which can be 3,200, 5,600, and some of them can be both, right? This is a fluorescent, Kinoflow fluorescent. You can change the bulbs. You'll see when we turn it on. You can change the bulbs uh, to either be 5,600 or 3,200. This is a tungsten light. It's a soft light. We have typically three kinds of light that we work with. And if you think about the sun, it should be pretty easy to uh, remember this. You have direct light, you have diffused light, and you have indirect light. Um, so imagine cloudless day, no clouds in the sky direct sun hitting you would be an example of direct light. Major characteristic of direct light is it creates hard shadows. Um, so they have their particular uses. A diffused light would be a cloudy day. And, you know, there's some, there's a thousand and one variations of the kinds of clouds that you experience. And, uh, and so there's a thousand and one variations of the kind of material you can use to diffuse a light. And then an indirect light would be, uh, monsieur, <laughs> an indirect light would be, since you answered the last one, <laughs> speak up to. Imagine a sun bouncing off a building. So I'm bouncing off a building so that it's indirect light. Or the moon. The moon is a, not a light source in itself, right? It's a reflective surface. And the sun's rays bounce off of it, right? No sun, no moon, right? Right. So, <coughs> yes. So this, this, is the, this is the human equivalent <laughs> of direct light. Um, one of, I don't, you know, there, there are different kinds of theatrical lights like this. Um, we picked this one because it has a Fresnel, right? And what a Fresnel does is it, okay, let's 
Actually, let me back up for a second. <coughs> Ta, S. You ever looked in one of these? Right, so that's basically um, this light and this light without the lens are the same light, right? And if you turn them both on, yes, let's turn it to the wall. Yeah, go ahead, turn it on. plugged in? Oh, yeah, okay, so. All right, since that one's on, I'll turn. All right, so. So basically, they're the same light, as is. Can everybody see me? Can everybody see the wall? light without a lens has this nice broad coverage or whatever, but it's <coughs> the shadow patterns it creates are a little bit, uh, well, more than just harsh, they're unwieldy. Like you just, you don't know how the patterns are going to go, which is why there's a lens, because then the lens collects the light, defines the path more, and the shadows are more definable. Um, basically, you have a bulb and you have a reflector in the back, and you can move the distance of the bulb from the lens, and it will change the spread of the lens as well as the concentration of of light. So, I don't know. Let me turn this one off for a second. Turn this one on. All right, I don't know if you guys can see. If you look at that lamp, the shadow from that lamp back there, do you see a secondary shadow? Do you see a secondary shadow? Do you see a secondary shadow? That's the primary shadow. That's the secondary shadow. You see that? Yeah? That's because the bulb is pointed at it. And part of the reason for this lens is you see that? That shadow's gone. See the secondary shadow? No, because you're blocking it. <laughs> if you can't see it, come come closer. There you go. That's even better. You see that secondary shadow? Wow. <laughs> right. It disappears when you put the lens in front of it. Right. That's why this sec yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. So you got two shadows. Yeah. Right. Which, so if you were shooting a scene in which somebody was walking through and the shadows were falling on the wall. You wouldn't want two shadows, like, right? So you would, and that's what you would get from both of these lights, because the bulbs are going straight at the subject. So a light with a lens in front of it defines the shadows much more clearly. And then you can adjust the spread of the light by like we said, moving in and out. The further, right, the further back you move the lamp from the lens, the narrower and more concentrated the light gets. Okay, and then you flood it out by bringing the, the lamp forward, and it spreads the light out. 
So these are both direct lights, but if I was to choose which one to use, I would always choose this because I know what the patterns are going to do, the shadow patterns are going to do. Right? So you'd rather shape light, light than subject. Say that again? You'd rather shape the light than the subject. No, no, we'll get into, uh, they, they sort of go hand in hand, okay. but, you know, it's like if I, like if I sat you down and I aimed this light at you, um, I might want a little bit of shadow from your nose, but I don't want two shadows. <laughs> right? So if I had to choose between these two lights without any diffusion, just pointing the light straight at the subject, I would pick this light over that light because I know what the shadows are going to do with this light. Because this one can zoom, this one doesn't. No, they both do. They both do, but it's just that the lens, the lens allows, uh, it focuses the beam oh, of the light. Doesn't it doesn't have a lens. And that means the light tends to scatter in an unpredictable way. If you need, and so if I need, if I need just an ambient level of light, I might use this light to bounce, but I wouldn't necessarily use this light on a subject, right? So, um, but yeah, so these are, these are just, you know, these are examples of what would be a direct light. If you pointed this at a subject without diffusing it or doing anything to it. But one would be preferable to the other because one has a more predictable pattern. It's also important, too, to know that um, the size of your light can determine how sharp that shadow is, right? A smaller light will actually give a sharper shadow than a bigger light. There's some math behind it that I don't understand 100%. <laughs> no, but it's real. You know, think of the sun. You know, the sun's 93 million miles away. It's a pretty darn bright source, but it's a small source because it's 93 million miles away. And that's why the shadows you get from the sun are so sharply defined, you know? Um, so, I mean, I don't know how to do this because I don't know, let's see, let's turn this one around and turn it on. I don't know if you can perceive the difference in the strength of the shadow, but I'm almost 100% certain that at the same distance from the subject, this light will produce a harder shadow than that. So, you know, if you're lighting things where shadows are important to you or part of the deal, Understand how these lights behave. Um, flood or um, flooded. Damn, I gotta turn this one. <laughs> Bring it as close as you can to this one. Yeah. Uh. No, that's fine. It's not as bright because it's well. This is a 5K, and that's a 2K. Yeah. Turn that one off. Turn it on. I don't know if you guys can see the difference, but it's a principle that the physically smaller the light is, the sharper the shadows that it'll create, if it has a lens in front of it. That goes out the window <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't have a lens. So anyway, these are both direct lights. This is a direct light. I would only use this direct light if I was not using it on a person. I would use this. I would prefer to use this on a person. Um, if you're going for a dramatic effect, using a direct light where you want the shadows, you can control the light, the amount of light, without changing the character of the light by putting in, do we have any scrims? I'm sure you have a scrim somewhere. Ah, oh, let's see, where are we? Uh, doesn't matter what light it's for, but, huh? 
the round, the round metal thing. Okay. Uh, huh? No, not that. All right. Let me give me a net though. Where were those nets? I saw a net. No, I, saw, I pulled a net out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Where's the net? Yeah. Just take it off the stand for me. Yeah. 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 So basically, a scrim is the metal equivalent of this. And it allows you to put it right, right after, the lamp, after the lens, because that's where it doesn't change the character of the light. The further away you put it from the light, it starts to change the character of the light a little bit. But that's how you control the amount of light coming from this and hitting the subject, is putting a scrim. You can also do it with a net. You know, it, it does have the same effect. Um, but yeah, or you can put it on a dimmer, right? And what a dimmer will do is it'll control the amount of electricity going to the light, meaning the less electricity going to the light, the less powerful the light is. Uh, there's a drawback to that, though. Can anybody guess? Well, not, no, not flicker. So I can change the color temperature. Color temperature, right. So this light is burning at 3200K. So when you set your camera to 3200K, if I put a white card in front of it, it'll read as white, right? Much the same way if I put the camera to 5600, I turned on one of the 5600 lights, I put a white card in front of it, it will read as white. So in this case, if I put a, this light on a dimmer and I dial it down to control the intensity, the color temperature is going to get warmer because you're feeding less electricity to it. So that white will no longer be white. It'll become orangish, brownish. If that's an effect you can live with, if that's an effect you're going for, then great. But if it's not, then a dimmer would not be the way to control this light. So you would have to use the scrim or use a net. And what a net does is basically controls, just you'll see this light get dimmer, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But look at the shadow, though. From the lamp, it doesn't change, right? So basically, this is a way to control the amount of light, but without changing the character of the light. So if your shadows are important to you, um, you don't want to change it. Now, you, I mean, you can also do this, but let's assume you're working on one with one or the other. Same thing. You want to control the light, amount of light? Right. Shadow is still the same, but less light hitting it, you know. So you could do it with this or you could do it with a scrim. In some cases, you do it with both, you know, if you have the space, because it might be fine tuning like, you know. Then here's another thing to keep in mind, too. Uh, you can also change the amount of light that's going. You can use a net like this, or you can use a net at an angle. Can you see me? You can use it straight up and down like this, or you can use it like that, and it lets even, more, even less light through because it's harder for light to penetrate this angle, this pattern of weave at this angle than it does like this. So you can do further light control by adjusting. Uh, can I get a time check real quick? 7.50. JT? Where's JT? She abandoned. Oh, she's having pizza? <laughs> Damn. Do you want a slice? No, no. I just want to know how much, time I, how much time I have. I'm bad with time. And I want to make sure we actually get some human subjects in here and do some lighting. So all right, so are we clear on why this light is the way it is? 
Yeah? Yes? You did mention, you said that if you were going to shoot a subject, you'd use that one, the big still one, the, what is that? Well, I wouldn't. A uh, Fresnel, right. Versus, versus that one, one of those, but, right. But it doesn't, it really doesn't matter between the two. It depends on how much light I need, mm -hmm. right? And if I was just shooting a human subject, I probably would not, this is a lot. I'd be using a smaller one, probably. And also because the shadow is more precise, I would use a smaller one. Um, but even then, I would still, you know, I don't like, you know, I, I say I'm not create necessarily married to one amount of depth of field or another, but you don't want to blind your subject, and you know, and you would only do a direct light like that if it was for effect. You know, um, our eyes certainly don't see that way for the most part. You know, or at least our brain. Yeah, exactly. You would you'd do that as a stylistic thing. Do you mind sitting there for me for a second? Just sit on the sofa. Yeah. I'm just going to go all the way over there. Go all the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I knocked that light down sufficiently, you know, for a certain effect, I mean, if I wanted to suggest he's, you know, he's in being interrogated, for example, right? Mm -hmm. This might, you know, a di direct light that creates a shadow might be the thing to use. Right? So you'd pick and choose creatively the situations in which you would use a hard light versus a soft light, you know, whether the soft light is diffused or bounced or, you know, what have you. So um, do you feel interrogated? Yeah. You do? <laughs> All right. You can get up. Um, Depends on, no, absolutely. No question about it. No question about it. Your light plays a, th a thousand and one roles, and they're not all technical. <coughs> Some of them are emotional, and you know. Yeah, I mean, imagine what it's like for an actor to walk onto a set that's been lit, and it's like it's emotional, and it's, you know, it's just, yeah, yeah. All right, so, um, so, um, an open face light is one in which you can see the bulb. It has no lens over it. A Fresnel is one that has a lens over it. They're both direct lights. Let's plug this one in too. This is an LED. Um, light emitting diodes is what LED means. And this kind of light is Oh, it has a it has a dimmer. It has a dimmer, but does it have color temperature? It doesn't have color temperature, though, right? Right. Okay. So, um, so this is also a direct light, right? Because the light bulbs are pointing outwards. Um, but as you can see, look at his shadow. Behind Do you feel interrogated? It's a different, <laughs> it's a direct light, but it's a different kind of shadow. It's not as intense, you know. Um, and to be honest with you, a person as close to the wall as he is, that proximity to the wall gives you a sense of the most intense a shadow will be, right? The farther away he comes from the wall, the d you know what? Let's kill the overhead lights. <laughs> JT, time check, please. Um, you, have, you have time. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Stay where you are. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Let's point it this way. No, you know what? Don't sit down. Let's just let's use the lamp again. Let's turn this light off. still a shadow, but it's a different kind of shadow, especially if you look at the stem of the, if you look at this, can you see there's multiple shadows, right? 
And there's multiple shadows because there's multiple diodes. Anytime you have multiple diodes or multiple miniature sources, each, one, each little one creates its own little shadow. So again, not necessarily ideal light to use direct, but it is a direct light because all the bulbs are pointing outwards. Now, if you can tell without um, putting a color temperature meter up to this, what color temperature would you say this light is? 56, right? Inherently, you can see that it's blue. And especially by comparison to that one when you turn, turn that one on real quick. Yeah. Yeah, so you see the difference in color between the two. Right. 